Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus Christ. Good morning and welcome to our Sunday ministration. It's good to be here again teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to you. I am glad when they say let us go to the house of the Lord. The month of July is a peculiar one. Seven stands for perfection. And I believe the almighty God will perfect everything that concerns you in the precious name of Jesus Christ. We have been looking at the subject of the Holy Spirit. And I believe that each and every one of us has had an encounter with a person of the Holy Spirit. On Wednesday, we began, or last Wednesday, we began looking at the fruit of the Spirit. We looked at the subject of love, joy, and peace. Now, we continue today by looking at the next three in the series by looking at long-suffering, kindness, and goodness. I know many of us have questions in our hearts, especially when it comes to relationship with other Christians or even non-believers. And I'm believing that today's sermon will answer these questions in our heart so that we can begin to live in harmony, in peace, and with our fellow brothers and our, our people at large in the world. Shall we pray? Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you so much for your love, for your guidance, your protection. Thank you for peace, thank you for joy, and thank you for watching over us throughout the month of July. We give you all the glory even as we go into the final week of the month. Father, please take all the praises in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Lord, as we seek to listen to your word, please open our eyes of understanding. And I pray, Lord God of heaven, that you will teach us how to relate with our fellow man as we study long-suffering, kindness, and goodness in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Give me clarity of thought, eloquence of speech, to the glory and praise of your holy name. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus Christ. Now, the Bible admonishes us to live at peace or in peace with one another. And sometimes we find this very difficult because we have people who have varying characters and have varying personalities. So we find it very difficult to live in peace and harmony with them. Some people just seem to antagonize us when we are trying to make progress in life. Now, the Bible says we should you know, bear one another. We should have forbearance, so to say. And we are talking about long-suffering. In other words, we have a very long fuse, um, unlike the world, when they have short fuse before they burn out and begin to lash out. And I'm hoping that God himself will speak to us as we begin to look at three specific fruits of the Spirit, which is long-suffering, kindness, and goodness today. Now, when we talk about long-suffering, forbearance, or sometimes patience, as some versions of the Bible might call it, oftentimes we might misinterpret it. And the reason being is the world at large at the moment talks about tolerance a lot, accepting other people's point of view, accepting people for who they are, being lenient, stop being judgmental, stop being stereo um, stereotyping people. And being open-minded to other ways, to other culture, to other ways of life. Perhaps they're not wrong. Maybe God made them that way and so on and so forth. And this oftentimes we find it difficult as Christians to live in harmony with other Christians. What should I do? People ask. They're saying we should be open-minded. They're saying we should be long, um, bear one another, be lenient have a different point of view, alternate lifestyle, so to say. Sinful behavior is not meant to be tolerated because you are chastising people or showing them the way, correcting them, does not mean you do not love them, does not mean you are not long-suffering. Now, situations sometimes will present itself that will want to provoke us to act out of character out of divine nature that's being imparted on us when we surrendered our life to Jesus Christ. Because now Christ lives in us, our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Sure, those kind of relation um, situations do come. And in those situations, our long suffering is um, tested. But we must not succumb to trials and tribulations that come our way. We do not succumb to circumstances and allow circumstances to control our emotion. We must control our emotions. We must control the flesh. 
And this is one of the things that is so key that demarcates or separates us from the world. So long suffering is the opposite of anger. And long suffering is almost the same as being patient. And being patient is not just your ability to wait, it's also the attitude that you have while you're waiting. It's not being slow. Because many people, when we talk about long suffering, some people think about slowness. No, I'm not talking about slowness. Long suffering does not mean that you don't have a sense of urgency about life, about situation. I think about the man at the pool, uh, the pool of Bethsaida. He had waited for 38 years. And you can say such a man has long suffering. But you know, he kept missing the time because the angel came at a particular time of the year and troubled the water. And whosoever was the first to jump into it became whole. Now, a man that is waiting for 38 years will be saying, well, I'm long suffering or I'm, I'm having patience. No, that is laziness. And we must be clear that we make demarcation between the two. Because sometimes we have mistaken long suffering for slowness, which is not what God is saying in the scripture. Now, what I'm talking about is to have long temper, unlike the world where they have short temper. Now, one of the places we often don't show long suffering or patience is at the traffic light. Now, many people can relate to this if you're a driver. As soon as the light turns green, you expect the driver in front of you to move. And the moment is more than two seconds, you push your on. You push your horn violently, you know, telling him, get out of the way. If you're not driving, pack your car. Why? Because we are short-tempered. Now, these are little aspects of our lives that we need to pay attention to. I've told this story before, perhaps I'll share it again. Many years ago, when I was a lot younger, on my way to church on Sunday morning, for a weird reason, I always find people cutting me up on the road. And believe you me, I will also do the same back to them, to prove a point to them that you don't do that. But one day I was praying and I was asking God for power. And as I was praying, the Lord spoke to me certain things, and I, I don't think I need to share that at this point in time. But one of the things he said to me is that power is dangerous in the hand of a child. And then it reminded me those Sunday mornings when I'm going to church and the people caught me up and I also do the same back and sometimes use language and not very Christian-like. And then I looked at myself and I said, true, Lord. So in other words, when you show no patience before men, don't expect God to be um, answering your prayer in certain areas because patience is a requirement for certain prayers to be answered. For example, if I gave you the code to the nuclear weapons of the world or America, as soon as you get angry, the next thing you punch in the code and then you fire the nuclear missile. Why? Because you got angry. If you're such a president, then you're not entitled to have those codes in your hand. So when we are talking about long suffering, we are talking about somebody that is long tempered. It takes a lot to get them upset. Now that doesn't make you a doormat. And I get more into this as I begin to preach. You're not provoked as every slight little annoyance that comes your way. There's no anger. You don't get defensive. You don't overreact. You have to keep yourself calm. It reminds me of a story of a, of a man who was with a baby in um, one of the grocery stores. And he kept saying to himself, keep calm, Albert, keep calm, Albert. And a lady that was pushing her trolley looked at the man as the baby was shouting and crying. He could hear the man saying softly in a calm tone, keep calm, Albert, keep calm, Albert. And then the lady went around a few times and came back and still noticed the man was so calm, his demeanor was, has not changed, despite the tantrums the child was throwing. So she, she walked up to the man and said, Sir, I must commend your patience. All I keep hearing you say is, Keep calm, Albert. Keep calm, Albert. 
Then the man turned to the lady. He said, listen, lady, I'm Albert. The baby has a different name. I'm telling myself to keep calm. So in spite of what the, your surrounding and your environment is playing around you, you must always keep calm. We need long suffering, every one of us. Don't forget, the measure that you meet shall be met back unto you. Whatsoever a man soweth, he will surely reap. So, the Bible says, judge not so that you will not be judged. These are reasons why we need long suffering. Perhaps one of the key reasons also that we need long suffering is that we need long suffering to maintain the unity of spirit. As the Bible said in the books of Ephesians chapter 4 from, from verse 1 to 3. And as preachers, we need long suffering more so that we can preach the word of God in season and out of season. We can be able to stand as ambassadors of Christ. More importantly, don't forget we represent the kingdom of God as children of God. So forbearance and long suffering, keeping calm in situations that seems to overwhelm you, whether positively or negatively. Because remember whom you are representing. Our mannerism will show what kind of God we serve. That's why the Bible says we should be slow to anger and quick to forgive. A man that constantly wants to win an argument will end up losing his friends. So you must learn to control your emotions. Wait on the Lord wait for his instructions many of us sometimes speak faster than our brains can think and by the time we have said it we realize that we have broken an egg and we can't put it back together and don't forget the bible says out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speak it so be very very careful don't allow your fuse to burn out quickly let your fuse be controlled by the Spirit of God. And this is what we mean by long suffering. Be slow to speak, be slow to get angry, as the books of James chapter 1 verse 19 has said. And I believe that God himself will perfect everything that consigns us. In life, we need patience. We need long suffering. That's the only way we can accomplish our goals. Because believe me, trials and, um, and tribulations will come. But if we don't have the patience and long suffering to withstand those storms of life, we might fall on the wayside. Patience is bitter, but the fruit is sweet. Think of the life of Joseph. Joseph was a man that easily could have gotten angry, but he was patiently waiting. The Bible says he entered into slavery at 17, but he didn't enter into the Pharaoh's court until he was 30. So about 13 years of waiting, yet he was never bitter. So let patience complete the work he has begun so that you can be thoroughly furnished and perfected. Remember, the Lord is always watching. The Lord is always watching. Let patience complete his work in our lives so that we are not lacking anything. Patience keeps us upright and it keeps us stable. That's the job of long-suffering, the same word as patience or the same word as forbearance. And I believe God will perfect all that concerns you, especially in this aspect of our lives, because I know many of us are yet to mature in this area. Even the prayer points that we pray shows that we need more patience before the Almighty God. Patience protects you against the wrong that others have done to you. Patience gives you the ability to trust God in spite of contrary wind that is blowing. Because you know that though he slays you, uh, you will yet trust in him. Now, let's look at gentleness. When I look at the word gentleness, I often think about the stamp on the postage package that you receive at home that says, Handle we care. Fragile. Handle we care. But when you look at uh, gentleness, it talks about an aspect of God. Because one of the representation or one of the symbols of the Holy Spirit that we studied earlier is the dove. And the dove is a bird that's easily chased away. It's easily statued. 
so to say, he's very calm and he's very kind. He's white, you know, he shows purity. So it's important that as Christians, each and every one of us begin to have this aspect of our life cultivated. We have kindness towards man and towards fellow human beings. Kindness is the hands through which love touches. Love needs love need hands, and that's kindness. Kindness is the hand through which love touches. We must show great strength under control, through gentleness, through kindness. Our heart must always be gentle, not quick to react to things because it shows that we cannot manage the little power that we have now. And then we are asking God for more power. Lord, increase my anointing. Lord, give me more power. Lord, expand my territory. But he's going to ask you, the one I've given unto you, look at how you have mismanaged it. Remember, he said, he that is faithful in little shall be faithful in much. So let us be kind to one another. Let's treat each and each uh, our, our fellow man, each other with with the kindness, showing gentleness at all times. Let's not be quick to respond. Let's not be quick to you know judge people, put people under condemnation. Now, there are many ways that God can develop kindness and gentleness in us. One way is the hard way. The other way is the soft way. Because many of times we find it difficult to learn the easy way. And not because God does not want to teach us the easy way, but because most of us, the Adamic nature in us has not died fully. Now, those that train horse or horses, Sometimes they tame the horse using whips and they beat him or the female horse to submission. And sometimes they use other means of communication. Now, it doesn't mean that the horse trainer hates the horse, but he has found out that that's the only way he can get the horse to obey instructions. Now, God also sometimes allows us to go through situations, allow people to oppose us. You see, allow us to fall into diverse temptations because then we can build our muscles and develop our strength. I think I've shared this story before, or perhaps I'll share it again. A man who was very puny looking, very skinny, so to say, in his build, who was very sickly, was in his cabin while he was praying to the Lord. And then he began to ask the Lord to increase his strength. Strengthen me, Lord. Give me more strength physically. Make me strong. Oh, Lord. And suddenly the Lord spoke to him. He appeared to him and spoke to him. He said, son, you see that rock outside the, your cabin? I want you to keep pushing it every single day. Keep pushing it every single day. So he was so excited about the, the, the instruction from the Lord and he began to do it religiously. He did it every single day, every single day. Now, after seven months of doing exactly what the Lord has asked him, he got discouraged. In his discouragement, he ran back to God and said, Lord, I've been doing this thing for the last seven months. Lord, I don't really understand what's the point and the purpose of it. Then the Lord said to him, stand in front of a mirror. Then he looked at himself. After he took off his shirt, he had six packs. And his arm was bigger. His chest was wider. He was not the same puny looking man seven months before. He had greater strength. He had greater muscles. Likewise, Christians, many times when God gives us situations, is not to destroy our confidence, but rather increase our faith. It's not to destroy our ability, but rather develop us. So that we can then look back and say, Thus far as the Lord helped me. And I'm believing that God in this season will transform our life through the power of the Holy Spirit. When we also get corrections, 
our gentleness increases. We must like to get corrected. Many of us don't like that. We must like to hear instructions. Many of us don't like that. Most of us say, well, the Lord will speak to me. No, he has placed people over you. Your spiritual fathers, your spiritual mothers, those who are your elders. You weren't raised by a pack of monkeys. You were raised by human beings. So why would you not take instruction from them? Especially teenagers. When they get to a certain age, you think their parents who has been raising them from their birth does not know what they are doing any longer. I often laugh when I hear them get angry. I, I, it saddens my heart, but I laugh at their um, naiveness, so to say. Now, it's important that our gentleness or um, kindness is not to make us a doormat, but is to show us, show the world that you can be strong and yet be gentle and be kind to people. You can be meek and yet still be strong because you're showing that your power is always under control. You see, blessed are the poor. For the Lord will deliver him. Blessed is he that considers the poor, rather. For the Lord will deliver him in the day of trouble. We must begin to sow the seed of kindness. Because whatever a man soweth, he will surely reap it. I want to emphasize this. Make sure you are sowing seed deliberately. I've shared this one before and I'll probably share it again. A man of God, as far back uh, in Nigeria, was sharing a particular testimony. And he said this. He said, um, a time came that he wanted to encourage the pastors that were with him. And in so doing, he began to give them his ties that he had ministered with to encourage them and say, well, they have ministered with his tie, therefore they are soaked with the anointing. So he began to give out ties to as, as many as possible pastors that were with him and they took it gladly. So he was sowing the seed of ties. Now, not long after that, a time came that it seems like everybody that came to see him and brought him a gift, brought him a tie. If somebody goes to America, he comes back, he buys him a tie. If somebody goes to Dubai, he travels, he comes back, he buys him a tie. Another one goes to Australia, he comes back, he buys him a tie. So he got worried, um, so to say, not worried in quotes, as we know worry. So he went before the Lord and began to say, Lord, Everybody's buying me ties. I'm not, I don't necessarily need this much tie. I'm not trying to start a, a tie shop. And then the Lord spoke back to him and told him, he said, son, you are sowing the seed of ties. So you're simply reaping the harvest of ties. It's as simple as that. What you sow, you reap. So he got a simple revelation that transformed his life. If you want financial seed, begin to sow financial seed of kindness. If you want material seed in the future, begin to sow material seed of kindness. And you will begin to see how your harvest will be bountiful in that department. What you are desiring, that is the seed that you begin to sow. Now, number three, let's go to goodness as I begin to close. Now, when we talk about goodness, we, goodness depends on the context in which we are discussing goodness. For example, many of us read books and we say that book is good. Some people, we like our teachers in school, we say that teacher is a very good teacher. Some kid can read a book very well and say he's a very good reader. So goodness has to do with the context in which it's being defined. But when we are looking at the word of God, goodness is doing the right thing for the right reasons. Because many people can do the right thing for the wrong reason. For example, you might want to give alms because you want your brothers and your friends to know that you're very generous. Jesus warned against this in the scriptures. He said, if your right hand is giving, don't let your left hand know. He said, your father that sees you in the secret will reward you openly. So when you're doing good, be very, very careful that you're not doing it for the wrong reasons. 
Many people have done that and they therefore have lost their harvest. I want us to be very careful in this, con uh, in this situation. But goodness is not just about doing good deeds. Almost everyone will have done something good in their lifetime. Even the worst people in the world, tyrants, killers, murderers, have done something good in their lifetime for somebody. So, it doesn't make you a good person, so to say. But when you do the right thing for the right reason, then you are um, doing what is called general or showing the fruit of um, goodness in your life. And this is so key for each and every one of us. We must begin to see our lives as an example for the world to begin to emulate. Many of us don't consider ourselves as ambassadors. Believe me, each and every one of us are representing Christ. And we must be able to show to the world who we are. Some things that we do in life don't cost us anything. But yet, many of us refuse to do it because we just don't want to get inconvenient. Now, you will get inconvenient in life if you're going to do good deeds for the right reasons. That's just the way life is made. But your father that sees you in secret, surely he will reward you openly. Let me begin to break it down a little further. What can qualify a right reason or right motive for doing something? Even our prayers, God considers our motives. He said, you have not because you ask not. He said, when you ask, you ask amiss or you ask with the wrong motives. So the first part of goodness must be our heart. If your heart is defiled, because out of the uh, say out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. He said the heart is where life proceed from. Proverbs chapter four, verse twenty-three. So our heart is the first and foremost thing that we must take care of. Let our heart be saturated with the word of God. Let it be sanctified. Let it be purified. So that the thoughts that proceed out of our hearts and the actions that our body actually convey, both of them matches. If there's a misalignment between the two, then our good deed is done for the wrong reason. Because our heart is not in it. Some people do it just to get rid of people. You do good deeds, please leave me alone. Just take it and go. Is that for the right reason? Think about it. So, let there be an uprightness in your heart, in your life. Show that you are truly doing it not because you want people to see you or get rid of the person, but because you want to do it for the right reason. Always express, goodness always expresses itself in the best interest of others. Perhaps that's one of the acid tests you want to use. Goodness always expresses itself in the best interest of others. So sometimes you have to rebuke people. You have to correct people. You have to chastise people. It doesn't mean you have lost your goodness, your kindness, or your love for them. It simply means you want to see the best in your their best um, interest at heart. That's what you have. Now, goodness also motivates spiritual excellence. Spiritual excellence. You see, God is good. Jesus said, only God is good. Only God is good. And God says, I am holy. Also, you must be holy. And for that reason, goodness must motivate or cultivate spiritual excellence in our lives. Each and every one of us must strive to live at the highest standard of purity. For this is what God desires from us. And this is why he has given us the Holy Spirit to help us. I'm saying it again, that the Holy Spirit is perhaps the most underutilized force that's available to the Christian. We must begin to engage the Holy Spirit in all that we do. Remember, he said, in all of your ways, acknowledge him. So sometimes when we think this thing is too hard, it's too hard because you are focusing on your own personal strength to accomplish it and not looking at the mightiness of God 
which is personified in the person of the Holy Spirit, which is given to the church, which is given to the saint, which is given to you and I. Now, why is goodness so important as I begin to close? Number one, we were created in Christ for good works. He said, how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with Holy Ghost and power, who went around doing good. And as he is, so we are in this world. So we are created in Christ or recreated in Christ for good works. So every one of us must go out doing good. And we must imitate God or imitate Christ. Remember, John, uh, um, Paul said, he said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. So we must imitate Christ by doing good because this is what God expects us to do. And we are called in the manner worthy of God or the Lord. God's standard, as I begin to close, is the standard for goodness. And we must keep his commandments because he is the one that's given them unto us and we must obey them. And finally, we must use our talents to glorify God. God is faithful in all ramifications. Goodness is supposed to help us in our relationship with our fellow man. Because many times, many of us struggle. And I believe that God himself has spoken to you. As we have considered various aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. I'm seeing that your life is changing already because surely God is taking to a new level. You see, there are some things in our life that we are praying for. We are seeking God's face in prayer, but there's a requirement that must be in place first. And I believe strongly that there's some anointing and a level in the realm of the spirit that you cannot reach until certain fruit of the spirit is matured in your life. Whether it's anger that you need to get rid of, whether it's backbiting, whether it's um, lack of love, and etc., etc., you must begin to look at it from the point of view of God. Because the fruit of the Spirit shows that you have the skills and the ability to handle those powers or those blessings that come in your way. Or else you will be like the man that is given the blessing, and the next thing he does is to oppress his neighbor. So, begin to reflect on your life. Begin to look at how, on places where you need help, and begin to call upon the Holy Spirit to direct your footstep so that you would not fail and you would not fall. You are able to suffer long. You are able to show kindness and you are able to be good. For the Holy Spirit is here in the world with us and it will help us, it will counsel us, and it will move us to the next level in our walk with the Lord, in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Now shall we pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you glory and honor. We bless your holy name. We thank you so much for your word as comfort with life and power. Lord, we ask in any area of our life where we are lacking in long suffering, in kindness, in goodness, please reveal to us. Help us to make changes through your Holy Spirit. We give you all the glories, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. Thank you, Father, for answering our prayers. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus Christ.